You can tell when somebody comes in here and they haven't been to a video store in a decade. Their eyes light up. We want to welcome that. They discover that this is a place that contains a broad representation of many kinds of world cinema. We have movies that are out of print, movies that are hard to find, the rare, and something that you've never seen before. We like to find the diamonds in the rough. It's like a group of friends hanging out, talking movies, having a good time. They're here at Videodrome. When you talk about Cary Grant, you're really talking about a multitude of different people. You're talking about young Archie Leach. Whenever you think you've got the morning post licked, it's time for you to get out of town. Whistling in the dark. Well, that isn't going to help you this time. You're through. Listen, the last man who said that to me was Archie Leach just a week before he cut his Is throat. Is that so? Young Archie Leach, he leaves home, age 14. He goes and he joins a traveling vaudeville troupe and he learns a lot of skills that will serve him throughout his career. Pantomime and acrobatics and really kind of cultivates a skill for getting a rise of an audience without saying a word. But I think later in his career, you think of something like Bringing Up Baby, mm -hmm. where his face is so rubbery and expressive, and he also does the whole Marx Brothers slapstick, falling down, pratfall thing. And I think he later on figured out how to nuance that Mm -hmm. How to make that kind of early, overstated gesture, overstated actions work for him. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because it was that sort of contrast with the debonair and cool Cary Grant when he would slip into that mania. Right, or a synthesis of the two. Yeah. This sort of like um, sophisticated, somebody you trust, and therefore that's why it's so entertaining to see him be so silly. Now be big. Be brave. You will, Bianca. Fine. Can I use your phone? But that's why I think he's so beloved, because in an almost intimate way, he let us see the silly person. So many Hollywood stars never, ever express that kind of loopiness. He was close to embarrassing himself in certain moments in bringing up baby when he's wearing the woman's, you know, flouncy robe and, you know, jumping in the air and being a madman. There's always the potential for coming off badly, but he made it work. He made it engaging and fun and always tapped into that kind of boyish, quality. And I feel like he was successful at that because he completely committed to it. Yeah. And he wasn't sort of winking at the camera like, look, I'm a really handsome, full-grown man and not That's like a true. stocky character actor. Think it matches? Oh, yes. Blue ought to go with blue, huh? Fair to be coming. It's for a friend of mine. He's waiting downstairs. Oh, I see. Oh, well, are you? He was also good at working different kinds of sort of comic strains. Like, he was very influenced by the Marx Brothers, but he was also influenced by Charlie Chaplin. So I think you see that Chaplin-esque sensibility in a film like North by Northwest, where he's doing that shaving scene. He's kind of disguising himself from the bad guys with a layer of shaving cream, yeah. and he starts slowly shaving it away with Eva Marie Saint's tiny, tiny little <laughs> razor. And then he finally shaves down to a little mustache. I love I love that he could do that kind of really gentle, slow build comedy, but also full throttle. Crazy, with yeah. no winking. How do you do, Judge? Oh, this isn't a pump handle. He's sharp. Hey, you remind me of a man. What man? The man with the power. What power? The power of hoodoo. Hoodoo? You do. Do what? Remind me of a man. Remind you all. <laughs> Speaking of, like, slow build, creating the on-screen persona that we know as Cary Grant was a decades-long process. Yes. That went through a bunch of different evolutions, and he worked with a bunch of leading directors at the time that added little bits and pieces and got different performances out of him that together, you know, by the end of his career, formed the Cary Grant. I think you're right. I think he was a sponge, and an iconically self-made American. He took bits and pieces from all sorts of different people, from Noel Coward to Douglas Fairbanks Sr. And, you know, he was said to be perpetually tanned because he saw Douglas Fairbanks Sr. when he was crossing the Atlantic for the first time right. he met him and just admired his healthiness, his healthy visage, and so made that part of his identity. Now, you're all under arrest. 
The whole bunch of you. And you too, and you know why. Her Majesty's very touchy about having her subject strangled. All right, I can't waste any more time. Come on, wrap up all your gear. You're coming with me. Hurry up about it. He worked with Howard Hawks. He worked with George Cukor. He worked with... Leo McCary. Leo McCary. Joseph von Sternberg gave him his strong side part. Right. He was yeah. the one who came right. up with that exactly. hairstyle. Yeah. And now we can't think of his hair any other way. Right. Mm -hmm. Except when he goes crazy in Haywire, and then he gets that little forelock dangling, and then you know he's really on the crazy train. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get out of there. Do you want to be poisoned? Do you want to be murdered? Do you want to be killed? Do you? Oh. The fact that he was so independent in an era of complete studio control over actors' trajectories, he only signed one contract with a studio, and once he got out of that, he was free to choose his collaborators and his directors and his co-stars to a latitude that a lot of stars were not able to afford, and I think most, that, right? Yeah. And I think that did uh, wonders for him self-consciously creating the persona that we know is Cary Grant. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's interesting how he was this, he had his own one-person star system of developing himself more and more, but like you said, it's almost completely unique that he was never under contract. So watching these movies, it's important to keep in mind that he, while he may not have written the roles or always done them because he loved it, you know, mm -hmm. or he thought it really hit, he chose all of those roles mm -hmm. and uh, probably rejected many mm -hmm. that uh, he thought wouldn't help improve his persona. What are his chances if you don't operate? He isn't a prayer. You'll die. Okay, then we operate. Hitchcock talked about how there was something sinister to the Cary Grant character, and he really brought it out, especially in a film like Suspicion, where you have this suffocating charm that is gaslighting his poor wife. You sold the chairs to gamble all your money on a horse. Well, I'm not exactly. I owed the bookies some money. It's an ancient story, but you know how bookies are. <laughs> what can I tell you? You see, I got the 200 pounds to pay them off. But then along came this hot tip, and... Oh, darling, come on, give us a smile. <laughs> come on, old girl. I know. You tickle that chin, I'll make faces. Think that'll work? Come on, son. Hmm? Come on, dear. I loved watching that film again. It felt so contemporary and true crime in some senses because, you know, he's like the ultimate conniver. He's the kind of guy you read about, you know, in detective novels who sweet talks and seduces a woman into going against, against her best intentions. Mm -hmm. He's so smooth. He's Cary Grant. Who can resist? Church, are you? Certainly I am. Oh, no, you're not. You're coming for a walk with me. Oh, don't be ridiculous. I don't want to do it. I'll touch you for it. Heads you do, tails you don't, huh? And yet, at the same time, the film's so romantic. It's one of the most romantic films I've seen lately because here's Joan Fontaine. She's basically overheard her parents say she's going to die a spinster and never marry. And then who should come along but Cary Grant? Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. <laughs> who wouldn't go for that? She completely upends her life's journey. And I loved how she was reading a child psychology book on the train at the very yeah. beginning, like the opening shot. I was like, it seems like a little nod to R.G. Leach. He does well with women oh, in trains. Yeah. In Suspicion, he's superficially charming in the true crime sociopath sort of way you're describing, but also Cary Grant, the actor, has his own sort of charm that is not superficial underneath. Mm. I don't know if you if you. And I think Hitchcock that. loved working with him because he saw a streak of melancholy in Cary Grant that he probably felt too. I mean, he was his alter ego. I think he played into that darkness that was obviously roiling around in Cary Grant because of his very unhappy childhood. What the devil do you know about business? Oh, very little, Art. I was only... I suppose, Biggie, you're taking you seriously. You'd have ruined the whole scheme. You realize that? Yes, but if it went any good. That's my business, not yours. If I say it's good, it's good. I'm going through with this deal. I don't want any interference from you or anyone else. Is that clear? Yes, that's clear. Pauline Kael talked about how he was one of the last actors to really just not see the roles he took as expanding his 
artistic oeuvre, you know, he was a workman. Right. This was a job, he was a craftsman, he learned the art of acting. For an actor like that who didn't come up in the silence, even though he was vaudeville, mm -hmm. he, I think Kale's point was something about him being unburdened by the need to um, be artistically validated or to prove to his audience that he's a serious actor. Mm -hmm. And so he could do a Bachelor in the Bobby Sox and sort of go on to another prestigious role untarred because he, he just sort of is so self-contained and so unique that people just accepted Cary Grant throughout his entire career. But I was introduced to Cary Grant through his work with Hitchcock and through Charade and, you know, some of his late period work. To go back and to discover this rich body of work that existed in his 30s and his 40s it was just so magical. And watching it with a trained eye on not what he says, but his his subtle inflections, his emotes, his raised yeah. eyebrows. He made it into an art form, into this, and that's why Screwball just agreed with him so well. Mm -hmm. Every gesture became a nuanced um, opinion. He could totally have like 10 opinions about somebody and just through these subtle reactions of just a, an eyebrow or a, a goofy look or a, a, a different stance. Yes. It's yeah. all so nuanced. I do think it's interesting that we think of the later Later, Cary Grant is maybe more iconic. It's crazy to think that he was 54 when he made North by Northwest. Right. With so many actors, would, that would be the bitter end. And yet, he's so amazing in that film because he is such the iconic Madison Avenue ad man. Uh, Maggie, in the world of advertising, there's no such thing as a lie. There's only the expedient exaggeration. You ought to know that. And it's what makes the film so horrifying. If even this man can be played, mm -hmm. if even this man can be kidnapped and unable to explain himself, what's in store for us? Right. Not that I mind a slight case of abduction now and then, but I have tickets for the theater this evening to a show I was looking forward to. And I get, well, kind of unreasonable about things like that. With such expert play acting, you make this very room a theater. <laughs> Grant also plays an ad executive in another film in this series, Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House. He is an ad executive throughout the entire movie, as opposed to North by Northwest. Uh, but it's much more uh, clearly stated that it's a critique of the ad industry. Miss Delwagon says advertising is a basically parasitic profession. You don't say. Miss Delwagon says advertising makes people who can't afford it buy things they don't want with money they haven't got. Oh, she does, does she? Well, perhaps your Miss Stellwagon is right. Perhaps I should quit this basically parasitic profession, which at the very moment is paying for your fancy tuition. He goes from being confidently conning people into buying things they don't need to being suckered himself by an ad in a magazine to purchase this dilapidated house. And I love that it's a film where he's in pursuit for once. Usually it's the women who are pursuing him, you know, right. Catherine Hepburn with a terrifying vengeance mm. in bringing up baby. But yeah. so many women, he remains unflappable and cool and women can't get enough of him. But in Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House, of course he's in pursuit of a house. Else. Right. The romance is, you know, nominally between him and his wife, played by Myrna Loy. It's really between him and this house for kind of inexplicable reasons why he takes this detour of born and bred Manhattanite and suddenly falls in love with a suburban dilapidated house. But it's kind of what makes that film fun for me because it's so different to see him with that strange passion. Muriel and I have found what I'm not ashamed to call our dream house. It's like a fine painting. You buy it with your heart, not your head. You don't ask how much was the paint, how much was the canvas. You look at it, and you say it's beautiful, I want it. And if it costs a few more pennies, you pay it, and gladly, because you love it. And you can't measure the things you love in dollars and cents. <laughs> But it's interesting because as the sort of man on top, like in North by Northwest, the top of his game is completely unable to make any good decisions at all, despite yeah. having cool heads around him mm. <laughs> telling him otherwise. Would you mind telling me in clear, concise English just what crime I've committed and why? In clear, concise English, you tore down a house on which another man holds a mortgage without first getting his written permission. Well, I... I did. 
the persona of Cary Grant is much more believable as a Madison Avenue mm. executive than it is, say, as a paleontologist mm. in Bringing Up Baby, where you see him in his coat and you're like, okay, like, costume just, like, throws a doctor's coat on. Like, sure. okay, you're a scientist now. Right. But... And he has the most superficial prop of the eyeglasses. And right. anytime he dips the eyeglasses, suddenly, <gasps> It's Cary Grant. Right. That's He's a key. heartbreaker. You can tell her that I'm a friend of Mark's and I have bats in the belfry, but don't ever tell her my name is David Huxley. Now, can you remember all that, Susan? Yes, David. You're sure? Yes, David. But you are good looking without your glasses. That's a complete uh, character change. Exactly. There's glasses on, <laughs> glasses off. And he comes around in the end. I mean, he stayed and buttoned down as a scientist, but by the end, Catherine Hepburn has led him on this crazy merry adventure, and so he decides that's maybe more of what he is mm -hmm. than the paleontologist looking for this singular bone yeah, to finish his dinosaur clavicle. skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> Now, it isn't that I don't like you, Susan, because, after all, in moments of quiet, I'm strangely drawn toward you, but, well, there haven't been any quiet moments. If you look at Cary Grant's enduring legacy, it can be kind of simplified to this kind of two-dimensional tableau of well-tailored suits and chiseled features and perfect posture and great demeanor, but I think that belies the fact that there's so much underneath. There's this undercurrent of abandonment, despair, and these elements that shine through in different angles through these films and through these directors who recognized what a complex character he was. If you have any accusations to make, make them in the proper manner. Otherwise, I'll have to ask you to get out. You'd ask me to what? Get out. And Matt, I totally connect with what you said. I think as much as Cary Grant represents this sort of dreamboat icon, he also is a very generational figure. I mean, I think of people in my grandparents' generation, some of our parents' generation, who had that persona of control. And yet, you know, there was complex stuff at work behind that mask. And so I think he's terminally fascinating because he does harken back to people, you know, in our mm -hmm. own experience. I'm no good. Why not? Scared stiff. How do you think the rest of us feel? Oh, no, you're not scared. I've looked at your faces. I looked at yours, too. It's the same as the others. You're scared? I'll say I am. By really watching a lot of these films from that different era, you get a much better impression of his range, even though he is just Cary Grant and played a lot of Cary Grant roles.